Uh, I want to start by reviewing Finsbury Growth and Income Trust's investment performance during calendar 2021. And in all candor, in all candor, I was a bit disappointed by our return in calendar 2021. The net asset value total return for Finsbury last year was plus 13 percent. Now meanwhile our benchmark, that's the thing we're supposed to outperform, our benchmark the FT all share index was up 18 percent. So you know there was a meaningful shortfall. Now Believe me, I really dislike underperforming. But it's also true to say uh, that I was really delighted in 2021 that the UK stock market, the FT All Share Index, put in a better return because, you know, it's been such a disappointing stock market, the, the UK market in recent years. Um, and, you know, when the UK does badly, um, that matters to me. <laughs> it matters to me because the UK, it's kind of my hood, if you know what I mean, if you know what I mean. Um, and, and anyway, I thought, however painful it might be, it, 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 it is just worth reminding ourselves of the scale of the, let's say, lackluster performance of the FT All Share Index uh, in, well, in recent years. What I've done on this slide is I've shown you, actually it's over 20 years, what, I, what I've done is I've shown you what would have happened if you'd invested one pound in a variety of stock market indices, if you'd invested one pound and then looked at it again in 20 years time with dividends reinvested, and seen what the resulting sums were. And as you can see at the bottom of the slide, one pound invested in the FT All Share Index turns into three pounds 37. Now, do you know, actually, that's not such a terrible outcome. That's still something like a, a 6% per annum compound rate of return. But Evidently, the UK stock market has been left in the dust by the US stock markets, particularly since 2011. You can see that the broader S&P 500 has well outperformed and even more so the tech heavy NASDAQ index in the United States. NASDAQ has turned one pound into the more than 10 pounds over the last 20 years. So what might happen next? And believe me, I, I, I would love to attempt to persuade or guarantee to you that the UK stock market might be the best performing stock market in the world for the next 20 years, uh, because if I could, that might see me through very neatly to my eventual retirement. But I can't, I wouldn't make such a, such a guarantee. What I do have to say is, is perhaps slightly more nuanced, but I still hope that what I'm about to say will be encouraging for Finsbury shareholders, and maybe even more generally for investors in the UK stock market. So again, looking at this chart, you can see what would have happened if 20 years ago you'd invested that pound into Finsbury Growth and Income Trust shares. And you can see over that period, actually, not only has Finsbury Growth and Income Trust outperformed its benchmark, the FT All Share Index, uh, 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 albeit that we didn't do it last year, 
that we, we've not only outperformed the all share, actually over time, Finsbury has outperformed the S&P 500 as well. You know, it's outperformed the broader uh, US stock market. And, you know, that's interesting. And what could one usefully deduce from that? Well, what I would say is that it's always been true and it remains true today. There have always been exceptional companies available to be invested in on the London stock market. Um, and if you have, as we've done, sought to concentrate your portfolio on those excellent world-class UK companies, it's proven possible over time to generate some pretty competitive returns. And I have to say, a fortiori, I feel that even more strongly today, just because the UK has been such a dull market in recent years, even the excellent companies in the UK look to us to be undervalued compared to their global peers. So to be a little bit more specific, what I'm showing you here is, well, to be more specific, we think, we think that there are four thematic industry ideas that are highly, highly likely to make money for Finsbury shareholders in ensuing future years. And on this slide, you can see I've uh, broken those or I've displayed those four thematic ideas in, in, these separate, uh, in these separate boxes. We have deliberately structured Finsbury's portfolio around these four money-making ideas. And although I know you can read, I'm just going to uh, uh, tell you what they are. Digital winners, luxury companies, and you'll see that combined, those two segments make up the majority of Finsbury's portfolio. And it's to those two segments that we've been allocating more capital over the last couple of years. But in addition, we're still very optimistic about the prospects for eternal brands. And we also remain fascinated by what's going on in the private wealth investment management industry all around the world actually but particularly in the UK. Now let me just put some flesh on that proposition that there's money to be made by investing in these four thematic ideas and building a portfolio around those ideas. And the way I thought I'd do that is by having a look at what worked for Finsbury's portfolio in 2021 and what didn't work for the portfolio. So our winners and losers for last year. And again, the context is we underperformed. Nonetheless, from my point of view, there were some really encouraging share price movements in 2021 that I take as a harbinger <laughs> for future returns. So if you look at our list of winners, you can see that pretty much every substantive or major investment that we have in a digital winner, pretty much every single one worked for Finsbury last year. So for instance, Relex. Relex, uh, it's one of the biggest holdings in Finsbury. Uh, Relex, we think, is obviously one of the best companies of its type in the world. It's a data analytics and software company. It's as good, if not better, than its direct peers uh, around the world. Relex's shares have 
outperformed the FT or share index every year since 2011. And actually last year was no exception. As you can see, the stock was up something like 37%. Similar idea, another major company with, with similar credentials, Experian also did really well in 2021. Looking at this idea of luxury and premium products, as you can see, our spirits companies did well in 2021, particularly Diageo. Diageo, that's the biggest holding in Finsbury. Um, Diageo stock was up over 40% last year, thank goodness. Um, I will have an argument with anybody, and what's more, I will win the argument. Diageo is the best company of its type on the planet, and we're lucky that it's a UK listed business. Just last week, we had a meeting with uh, the CEO, Ivan, Ivan Meninis, and um, he pointed out to us, he said, listen to this, he said, um, the USA is our biggest market, it's Diageo's biggest market. Um, every household in the United States that buys spirits, and there's a lot of those households, every household nonetheless only, only spends $1 a day on this affordable luxury of premium spirits. And, and the CEO said, and we rather agree with him that that implies that there's still a long, long runway for Diageo, not just in the United States, but pretty much over the rest of the world as well. Fantastic company, fantastic opportunity. Looking on the other side of the ledger, though, uh, we, we had some, yeah, I, you know, um, some disappointments, um, most notably the London Stock Exchange. That was the biggest single detractor from our return in 2021. The stock was down a sobering, well, over 20%. Um, we bought a lot more. We bought a lot more, particularly in the second half of the year. But, you know, <laughs> that, that, that was disappointing. Um, Unilever had a year to forget as a share price. So did Hargreaves Lansdowne. Um, I have to say, perhaps the, the biggest disappointment in a way for me uh, were the two luxury companies that you see here as well, Burberry and Fevertree. Actually, their shares went up in 2021, as you can see, but they just didn't go up nearly as much as the, as the market. And I have to say that was disappointing for us because to us, looking at the progress that both Burberry and Fevertree made as businesses, yeah, we would have thought that the shares should have done really much, much better. So maybe, maybe that's a 2022 outcome. I sincerely, I sincerely hope so. So I've just mentioned uh, two company names, uh, Experian and Fevertree. And I did that deliberately because I now want to offer you a change of voice. Um, and I'm gonna ask Madeline to uh, spend five minutes or so with you explaining why we've been building and continue to build holdings in Experian and Fevertree, and why we think both of them are potentially such great investment opportunities. So over to you, Madeline. Experian's a good stock to talk about today, not only because it's our newest holding, but also because it's a fantastic example of the kind of world-class data-owning company Nick means when he talks about increasing the portfolio's exposure to digital winners. Experian, as you probably know, is a global credit bureau, which means it holds a cache of data about individuals' credit histories. 
We think its ownership of this huge store of unique data makes it incredibly valuable. And its ability to expand the utility and application of that data makes it likely to become even more valuable in the future. Since Experian was founded in 1968, it has built up an increasingly valuable database covering 1.3 billion people and 166 million businesses across 44 countries. And this data collection is an ongoing process. In the UK alone, Experian adds 750 million records to its database every single month. And globally, there have been 110 million signups to Experian's direct to consumer product, with 41 million of those in the USA. We've spoken to Experian's US competitors who admit that Experian does some things better than them, including that direct to consumer offering. Experian processes all these data points, makes sense of them with analytics, and then sells them to customers in the form of a credit report. Customers could be any company who lends money, but banks or credit cards are typical. And customer renewal rates are very high at over 90%, as these credit reports are critical for assessing risk when lending. But even though they're critical, they're not expensive. A single report costs just one, to one or two dollars, making this a volume business, which makes up a low proportion of its customers' cost bases. So there's little incentive for either industry price wars or for a new player to enter. More importantly, customers recognize that it makes no sense to risk using untrustworthy data just to save a few cents. So Experian's existing databases are very valuable in their own right. And the company is seriously pursuing a range of new applications. They range from that direct to consumer product right through to healthcare billing management. But we believe that the biggest growth opportunity is actually being brought in by the next phase of innovation. The active shift from simply selling data to selling data enhanced by decision tools. This means that the majority of Experian's investment goes into overlaying its data sets with proprietary algorithms and data management tools. In 2015, its decisioning segment, i.e. those advanced analytics and tools sitting on top of the data, was just 8% of total revenues. But in 2021, decisioning grew to 22% of revenues. We believe that the underlying data sets will continue to be essential products, but this shift to decision tools and therefore the increase in the utility and stickiness of those data sets is what will drive a really substantial amount of growth over the next decade. Experian calls this unlocking the value of the data, and this is a process they think is still at an early stage. So far, so promising. But it's all very well for us to talk about the quality of the company and the increasing value of its products without mentioning the key proof statement, and that's revenue growth. In the five years between 2016 and 2021, Experian saw its revenues grow at a compound annual rate of just under 5%. And in recent years, this growth has accelerated. Even in the midst of pandemic disruption, Experian saw 7% revenue growth in 2021. And momentum seems to be building. In January, the company upgraded its revenue growth forecast for 2022, and analysts expect the longer term revenue growth to accelerate to 10%, a prediction our modeling agrees with. We're encouraged to see Experian's initiatives translating into actual revenue growth. And we look forward to seeing the company continuing to leverage its unique position to accelerate that growth and capitalize on what we believe to be an enormous opportunity. Now, for the final few minutes, I'd like to go from software to soft drinks and use our second newest holding, Fever Tree, to show you how a company's careful handling of ESG factors can future-proof and enhance the value of premium consumer brands. 
Fever tree itself most likely needs no introduction. In the 19 years since it was founded, it's built the premium mixer category up from zero and carved out a market share of almost 45% of total UK mixers. And subsequently, it has added substantial and growing European and US revenues too, with some recent big leaps forward. For example, in 2021, both Fever Tree's ginger beer and tonic became the number one selling brands in each respective category in the US. As Nick has explained, we're attracted by Fever Tree's premium credentials. But many of those credentials also attract us from the perspective of addressing the growing consumer demand for environmentally friendly and ethical products. Fever Tree's use of glass, paper and aluminium packaging only, no plastic whatsoever, is protective from both an environmental and a premium experience standpoint. It looks great on the bar, and once the G&T has been drunk, the bottle doesn't end up in the ocean. Glass also offers scope for further ESG improvements. For example, in a recent conversation with a company, we were impressed with their plans to introduce a bottle return system, something that's only possible with glass rather than plastic. Similarly, Fever Tree's history of building close and supportive relationships with its suppliers, many of whom are small farmers with a single crop of, say, quinine in the Congo or vanilla in Madagascar, is attractive from both a quality assurance and ethical perspective. We want Fever Tree to treat its farmers fairly and in return, receive a reliable supply of quality ingredients with a premium provenance. A premium brand will only remain premium if it reflects the environmental and ethical considerations of its consumers, as well as delivering the superior experience they expect. We believe that Fever Tree's positioning and ongoing attention to the kinds of factors I've described will cement the franchise, ensure continuing quality, and boost the brand resonance with generations of more socially and environmentally aware consumers. In conclusion, getting ESG right makes investors money. So we look forward to Fever Tree's long-term strategy, making the business more valuable and continuing to improve its performance, which we hope will make a significant contribution to the returns we deliver to Finsbury shareholders. Cheers to that. Madeline, thank you. So I, I, I'm coming towards the, um, the close now, but I, I, I thought that the way I would wrap this up was to share with you just a handful of factoids, facts or anecdotes that we've collected or gathered over the course of the year that seem to us to be relevant and encouraging for the important investments that we have on your behalf in Finsbury's, in Finsbury's portfolio. So for instance, um, we were very, very intrigued to read what Hargreaves had to say uh, at its full year results um, last August, I think that was. Hargreaves pointed out that since the start of COVID, it has welcomed 375,000 new customers onto its platform. <laughs> it also pointed out that it took over 30 years for Hargreaves to get to its first 375,000 customers. And now today the total is probably about 1.6, 1.7 million, but it just shows you how rapidly that company continues to grow and continues to scale and continues to create value, we think, for its owners. Next, here's, oh, you may think this is a weird one, actually. Um, apologies if you do. Um, we were so interested to see one of the measures that Burberry has taken 
to ensure that its brand remains relevant with the younger generation, particularly the younger generation of wealthy US consumers. So in 2021, uh, Burberry collaborated with a US video games company, Mythical Games. It collaborated with this video games company to introduce a non-fungible token into that video game. So that's a character that you as a consumer can actually buy. There are a limited number of them, so they have a value. You can buy and play with that character in this game. The characters that Burberry have sold uh, are all togged up in Burberry gear. By the way, they cost $300 per character, so it's not nothing. Anyway, Burberry's, uh, Burberry's NFTs sold out within 30 seconds, and we thought that was smart and interesting. By analogy, uh, we have the investment uh, in Finsbury in Mondelez that we inherited from our long ago holding in Cadbury. And similarly, was so intrigued to see that even though Oreos, the biscuit brand in Mondelez, probably the biggest brand in Mondelez, even though Mo Oreos were introduced well over a hundred years ago, today they remain Generation Z, let's put it Z rather than Z because we're talking about US consumers, Generation Z's favorite food brand. So these brands with eternal characteristics that from generation to generation can attract new loyal customers like Oreos, Cadbury's, Burberry, like Unilever's Dove, like Unilever's Magnum Ice Cream, these are enormously valuable and value creating brands. Maybe just finally, I, I, I might turn back to the London Stock Exchange. Why did we add to our holding, uh, you know, into a dismal share price performance last year? And the reason is that once the dust had settled on the Refinitiv transaction, and when we look dispassionately and objectively at the new business, to us, the LSE group is a much stronger company with much better prospects than the old LSE. Yeah, it's become a truly, truly powerhouse financial market data, financial market distribution and collection of liquidity pools. It really is. I'm a refinitive Refinitiv's real-time data service, that is taken by essentially 100%. All substantive you, you financial institutions on the planet use that service. That's a valuable pipe for the LSE's data as well. The LSE now, at one step removed, but forget that, the LSE now speaks for 17% of the daily trading volume of the US government bond market. That came with Refinitiv. The LSE now owns the world's biggest currency trading platform. That came with Refinitiv. In, you know, when you look at the combination, there's just so much that can be done with this merged set of assets. And because the share price was down last year, well, to us, there's a there's a fantastic opportunity to take advantage of other people's other people's skepticism. So there we go. Um, I might just conclude. You can switch off now if you want, because I'm just going to repeat myself. Uh, if I concluded, what I would say is that I sincerely hope that the UK stock market might be meaningfully undervalued. But I don't know that for sure. What I do know for sure, though, is that there are many truly outstanding companies quoted on the London stock market that are at least as good 
as their global peers, if not better, and that those UK quoted companies in many cases are meaningfully more lowly valued than their global peers. That really should be uh, a combination that, that, that drives attractive returns uh, in future years uh, uh, for Finsbury and maybe for the UK market uh, uh, as well. And, and of course, I sincerely, sincerely hope so. Thanks very much for listening.